In this, we are praying for God to have mercy on us and on our world. Our Kyrie this morning was written by Larry Olson in 1989 and is found in our hymnal on page 184. And there are hymnals in the chairs around you for those of you who would like to read it out of the hymnal. Often the Kyrie is followed by a song of praise. And this morning our song of praise is doxology, a well-known hymn from the 17th century. I'll sing the doxology with us. We're going to do this a cappella. So I'm going to ask you all to sing with energy. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him all the heavenly
You may be seated. It's not a good Lutheran doxology without the amen, right? Today's scripture is from, first lesson is from Psalm 31, various verses. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You indeed are my rock and fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. And then from Romans 3, this was a part of our reading for this past week. Romans 3, verses 5 through 20. But if our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. But no, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as, as some people slander us by saying that we say, let us do evil so that good may come. Their judgment is deserved. What then? Are we better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin, as it is written. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. Here is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their path. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whoever, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Here ends the good news for today. It is. It really is. Oh, got it. Need this with me. So just a quick refresher. Whoa, I got really loud. Um, just a quick refresher. We're doing this series on Romans. We started last week. And um, each week, uh, Jeff and I are going to preach, teach together. And um, partly because Romans is Jeff's favorite book of the Bible. And I found that out. And so... Um, we're encouraging you to participate in this and guarantee you you'll get more out of the sermons on Sunday if you do the readings beforehand. And so um, I'll give this week's reading to you before we leave today, but it's also in the bulletin and on Teams. You can pick it up there as well. Um, and we really encourage you to send your questions, your thoughts to us um, via Teams or jane at faithgolden.org, my email. 
Um, we encourage you to talk things over with a friend. Paul is not always easy to comprehend. He uses lots of words a lot of the times. And so um, talk it over and see what a friend is reading. Also in the bulletin, there are um, some commentaries that we encourage you to, to pick up one of those if you're that kind of a, a studier of scripture. Um, but again, you'll get a whole lot more out of what's happening here if you do the reading before. And so uh, this week's past, this past week, you were supposed to read from uh, Romans 1, 1 through 3, 21. And so we encourage you bring your Bibles, bring things to write on, pay, take notes, because uh, again, it's a teaching lesson more than, than the style of preaching that you're used to. So um, we're not going to, uh, there are, to, oh, there also are Bibles in the, the seats around you. And so um, you can pick one of those up um, as well. But um, let's get into this week. This week was all about the rules, those things we so love, right? We have to remember that Paul is describing the Christian faith to the Romans. These are Christians that were Jews, mostly Jews that have converted to Christianity. And Paul, in these verses, is setting up the first part of the system of faith. We talked about that last week. Um, about this setting up of a system. And if you did the reading, then you saw that Paul was, was first of all, he was praising the church in Rome. And then it feels like all of a sudden, he is just like, he jumps to the wrath of God is being revealed. And it feels kind of harsh, right? And um, it's, and uh, and again, remember that the, the first section where where Paul is praising the church that's the introduction to the, the letter. So introductions in the ancient world were really long. So the introduction to the letter was all that praising. And then, then Paul skips over to this setting up, this understanding um, that we're going to talk about today. And so um, Paul is not, it is important to know that Paul is not correcting the church in Rome. He is describing the first part of the system that says, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we cannot achieve righteousness by following the rules. That's what he's doing, right? And so, um, how do you feel about rules, Jeff? You like them? <clears throat> well, you know, you know we, we <laughs> certainly live with rules in our everyday life, and uh, you know, rules to me are an interesting thing. I, you know, it's part part of the the governance system that uh, we we all live under. Uh, but uh, rules are made uh, to accomplish a certain purpose, and uh, that objective uh, is really important uh, when we're setting rules. And you know, just for an example of that, if you think about banks, uh, over the last couple of years, the rules in banks changed. Uh, a few years ago, had you walked into a bank and wearing a mask, uh, it might have been a problem. Uh, that security guard probably would have uh, confronted you. Uh, but in the last couple of years, the objective changed to one of public health as the precedent. And and now, for the most part, banks, uh, you know, had uh, been uh, requiring masks. So, you know, very, very, a fundamental change due to a change in the objectives. <clears throat> and um, if I tell you now, today, that uh, we have a new rule here in church on Sundays that uh, now uh, everybody has to wear blue shirts. I'm good for today. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> You're rightly so. You'd probably ask why, right? And uh, so that really gets to what's the what's the reason behind uh, uh, a particular law? And rules and laws are put in place to accomplish uh, that whatever that something is. And we only follow the guidelines and uh, if we believe that the objective for those rules is right and good. And so Paul, when he's uh, uh, talking to the church in Rome, he assumes that his audience already understands that shared objective, uh, that, uh, th that we exist. We exist for a particular set of reasons and that the rules are established uh, for that set of reasons. And so it's good um, to look at that, the biblical view that those followers had around the rules. But before we do that, Jeff, what about how about we address the um, what we see is the common models of rules in our society so we can understand what the difference is between the two. Yeah, I, I actually, I really think that there's three primary different kind of uh, philosophies that uh, underpin uh, the, the culture in the United States primarily here today. 
And, and you know, the first one is one that is cropping up uh, pretty significantly, mostly in our young people, but it's but it's uh, it's really growing. And uh, th that is uh, a philosophy of uh, nihilism. Uh, and you know, nihilism uh, you know, basically says that we don't exist for any reason at all. Sure, we exist, but there is no really under underlying particular reason, and life doesn't have any inherent meaning. Uh, so basically, there's no reason for rules except for to uh, to exist uh, together. And uh, you can basically do whatever you want without having any eternal consequence uh, to it. So you know, law in our society is effectively established by powerful people who, you know, using, you know, basically might makes right kind of uh, uh, philosophy and thinking. Yeah, it does remind me a lot of what I hear in um, some of our younger generations today, just that, just in plain general teenagers, those of you who are parents of, right, that the rules don't matter, the rules shouldn't matter, because life doesn't really matter, it doesn't matter what I do right now, there's no eternal consequence, or there's no real even real consequence in my day to day. So what does it matter? Why can I not do what I want to do? Yeah, I think uh, it's really a tragic situation yeah. because uh, I mean, you could look at the universe and the glory and the majesty of the universe. And some people would say, well, that makes me feel small, yeah. right? Because uh, the, the universe is so big, I'm so small. Another, another way to look at it would be to say, well, look, the universe is is so big you know how important does that make me that god cares about me yeah. right so yeah. it's, it's it's very very different a, a second philosophy that we see pretty commonly today is one of uh hedonism and hedonism what you know we think of in a very uh negative or pejorative sense but you know when when plato you know, was describing hedonism in the you know bc times he was not describing it in a negative way but uh, but really that the objective of life is our personal experience. So we're just living life for a sense of the experience of life. And uh, you know, Epicurus came along and created this whole Epicurean thing. And uh, that's based on a hedonistic perspective of I'm trying to accomplish uh, uh, that personal experience of life, in this case, by tasting foods and just in the overall enjoyment of it. But it's really about me. Yeah. Uh, it's really very much you know, the, the purpose of life is about me and my experience while I'm here. Yeah, and I think we've gotten to that so that we hear hedonistic and we think like all the way off the deep end. Um, but it's not. It's, it, it is, I would say, a lot of what our society is built on, right? Um, up and to the right, right? More and better. That's, that's the goal of a capitalistic society that we live in, but more, we need more and we want better. And, and that understanding of our lives is that um, in this world is that we need a more and better life. Somehow we need to make a mark. We have to be like on an epic journey to make our mark in the world. And we, we, ask, we frame that even with our littlest ones by going, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? Who do you want to be when you grow up? Or, or um, you know, and we ask as we get older, what is the legacy you want to leave? And it's not that it's bad, but it is all part of that hedonism idea of making the most of your life. Yeah, and then uh, one that uh, really uh, we see predominantly over the last 150 years, which is really much more of a, a collectivist viewpoint. And uh, in the in that sense, it's not my life that matters. It uh, it's our life together, and, and that you know my role is to be a cog in the wheel of uh, of trying to accomplish something together uh, as a society. Uh, and oftentimes that just gets described or thought of as a utopia. It's a utopian view of what the kind of society that we can create together. And uh, that uh, basically what we're, what the value of life is, is, you know, our progress toward that uh, utopian view. Yeah. In today's world, I'd say an example of that would be communism, where they're willing to sacrifice millions, right, for the sake of the greater whole. But it's not even just in far away from us, but it's here in our own country, too. I mean, I would say that the political debate in our society is an argument between hedonism and collectivism today. Mm -hmm. It's my right, my goals, what I want versus what is the good for all. And so so it's good to understand kind of the perspectives that that are undergirding our own society because um, because they differ so much from what the Jewish tradition understanding of daily life would have been. And so, um, and so Paul, in addressing the Romans, what's the worldview that they're living in? 
Well, it would would have been vastly different from any of those three perspectives, yeah. uh, and 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 uh, you know when you think about uh, the Romans, it's really good to understand that uh, philosophy so that you understand that assumption that uh, Paul is making when he writes uh, you know to the Romans. And the bi biblical philosophy is this: that at the core of our existence, we are here because God created us, and He created us for His pleasure. So unlike our pleasure in the hedonistic right. view, it's for God's uh, purposes and uh, for his pleasure. So we don't exist for ourselves. We exist for him. Uh, so his desire uh, is that we would have a, a relationship with him. And uh, Genesis, actually going back to the very earliest part of the Bible, you know, D Genesis is describing that Garden of Eden, Eden type of fellowship that God wants to have for our lives. It was the way that we were designed. The way that he made us was to be in fellowship and in this you know, closeness of proximity, just enjoying one at one another. And uh, you know, that, that creation story describes... Uh, uh, though a state of brokenness that comes about, and uh, that that brokenness comes about because uh, you know, as Genesis describes it, Adam and Eve chose to eat from the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which that brokenness then creates a rift. It breaks our relationship uh, with God, and uh, that rift is uh, is uh, you know what we will describe as sin. And the future then um, is described in prophecy throughout the Old Testament scriptures as a, a restoration of that relationship, that God is trying to bring us back into the closeness of that proximity of the, of, of the kind of fellowship that we can have with him. And, you know, the scriptures also talk about that restoration being brought about by a Messiah. Uh, so Jesus talked often about that restoration of fellowship, uh, too, throughout uh, his ministry. There was a big, big overall theme. You can see see a lot of discussion about uh, that fellowship. And he actually you know, uses uh, some uh, symbols uh, that, uh, that actually are used through a lot of scripture. Uh, you're describing marriage. So we talk about like the church is the bride of Christ. We're talking about that restoration of, of the fellowship, the relationship that we can have together. And so many of the symbols and even in our worship, uh, take communion, for, uh, for example, that's understood, it was understood as a part of the traditional marriage customs of the day. And uh, so we live in a world where that fellowship was broken and our objective ever since has been to restore it. Or God's, God's perspective, God's perspective. Yes, yeah. has been to restore it. Yeah, I mean, God is looking for that perfect relationship and God will not settle for anything less. And we could say, well, that's kind of picky on God's part, right? Because, like, do you want some relationship or no relationship? But what God wants for us is to be, to do the live the life that God created us to live, which is a life of relationship with Him. And so, in the the Jews and um, those early Christians that Paul is talking to, they would have understood that the goal of life is to figure out what God wants. And then do your best to follow the rules so that you give God what God wants. And this is why for them, the law was so very important. The problem comes then when the law, in the end, the law never makes us good. The law never makes us good enough. It only makes us aware of our brokenness and, and that separation from God. Yeah, I think about that as, uh, yeah, say, speed limit signs. And we're out driving on the on the highway. You see the speed limit sign that says uh, 55, 65 miles per hour. Um, actually, that speed limit sign, I've I've never found that it can make me into a good driver. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. you can always go at least five miles over without getting caught. That's right? right. But what that does is when I look at compare my my speedometer to the speed limit sign, I can see that I'm going over the speed limit, and so it make the speed limit sign made me aware that I'm uh, driving too fast for the conditions of the road. So all that the that the law does is it makes me aware that uh, of my sin. And uh, so sin is just a description of anything that separates us from that perfect relationship that God has uh, designed for us. And uh, you know, can anyone here say that they have a perfect relationship with God? Raise your hand. No, I don't see any hands. And uh, you know, if you're if not, you're acknowledging that there is separation in your life that comes from sin. And that acknowledgement is called confession, and it's an important part of our tradition.
It really is. This is one of the important places, or the one of the places to realize um, that in Paul, in the, especially like in the first and, and second chapter, there it feels like after he gets through the the um, the welcome, right, the the introduction to the letter, it sounds like he it feels like he's tearing people apart, like he's listing out all these sins, right, and and telling how every we're all unrighteous and. And that because, and he's pointing out that we cannot be good enough. They cannot be good enough. And um, no matter what we do, but what Paul is trying to do is to show not only the Romans, but all of us, right? That, um, that on our own, we will never be good enough. And so Paul is painting this picture that is leading up to the consequences of sin. One person remarked in their comments that they gave back to us this week that the reading this week sounded like the Old Testament fire and brimstone. It is, right? Because remember, the New Testament doesn't negate the Old Testament. But Paul is pointing out the, that the way of following the law means that we're not going to do very well. We're going to continually fall and falter. And like in chapter 1, verse 32, the consequence of sin is that we die. Game over, no afterlife, the end. And it is death after death, but it is also death while we live today. Again, here's another place to remember the context within which the Romans heard this. We think of relationship with God and we might automatically go to, and, if you, um, and I hear this a lot, mm -hmm. right? That we automatically go to being good enough so that I know where I go when I die. Right. It, and it's gotten translated into that question that that often gets asked, if you died tonight, do you know where you're going? Right. And so we put all of this emphasis on immortality, on what happens after we die. But um, the Romans, as they heard this, they would not have had that context because immortality wasn't a use, universally understood part of the faith in the Jewish faith. Um, there are the Sadducees, which were church leaders, and they did not believe in life after death. And then there were the Pharisees, who were also church leaders, but they did believe in life after death. So while heaven has become very much a part of the modern vision of faith, um, that, that prize at the end, right, that they were all working towards, um, that would not have been a concept that the first century Christians would have been familiar with. It actually... Um, the, the, the emphasis on that is a post-Reformation thinkers that kind of have, have um, uh, embedded that into our, into our way of thinking of faith. And so um, for the Romans, the, the goal, success, had been fellowship with God today in the here and now. Yes, maybe someday after you die, but they were really concerned about today because to them, Jesus was coming back was very real, not just something that might happen sometime. But, um, and they wanted to make sure that their lives reflected their following of Jesus. And so Paul is pointing out here the truth that none of them and none of us can do this perfectly, this following the law. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty conclusive in, these, uh, in the reading that we're all guilty uh, and uh, there's no exceptions. No, nobody can uh, be an exception. And that success is an illusion that evades us. Uh, the, you know, the law is much more like that speed limit sign that simply gives us the standard to show us that we are a lawbreaker. Um, and, you know, the truth is that you only actually have to break one law before you are a criminal, a criminal, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, and there's a book out written by a Harvard professor today that uh, he's done some study just on, on people living and uh, living their life. And he's come to the conclusion that the average person actually commits three felonies every single day, right? And uh, that's just, it's just the way that the law is. And, uh, you know, you can't say, well, look, I didn't know about that. Uh, we, you know, you broke the law, you broke the law, yeah. whether you knew about it or yeah. not. Um, and you also can't say, well, look, I'm, I'm better than most, right? Uh, if I'm yeah. going to compare Does myself. Does it really work? Yeah, you know, we're not, you know, God's not grading the law on a curve, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and I can't also, I also can't say, well, I'm more good than I am bad, right? Like kind of the scales yeah. thing, uh, you know, because. So you should let me off, right? Because yeah, I am more good than Just let bad. me off, yeah. right? And then. Uh, and then you, the, the other one that we hear that's a pretty uh, active excuse is, well, that's a stupid law, yeah. right? And you know, it shouldn't <laughs> yeah. have been there to begin with. <laughs> right. Um, 
you know, the purpose of the law was simply to make us aware that of our separation from God. Our, our, the sin is that separation. Uh, it doesn't matter if the system of laws is Jewish, uh, Islamic, or Buddhist. It doesn't matter if the law is formed from a religion or from one of the philosophies that uh, we talked about earlier uh, in this. So, uh, you know, the law can't repair, it cannot repair the rift that we have in our relationship with God. The law is just incapable of that. Yeah. That's why sin is a very serious subject, and we don't like to spend a lot of time with it. We want to skip over it, but but we, um, in the midst of our living in brokenness and sin, um, we want to recognize that God's heart, God's heart is that he would be our lover, that we would be in love with him, and sin keeps us from that full relationship. All of Paul's writings had earlier in chapters one and two, they're not a list of sins to judge other people by. And that's what often happens when we get into any of the texts where there are sins that supposedly sins that are listed out. We start making a list. We look at that list and we go, okay, well, that one's worse than that one. And that one breaks it more than this one. And thank goodness I just do this one over here. And right? you, you, no, you do that one a lot more than you know. Yeah, well, you know, and that would be judging. <laughs> So be careful, right? <laughs> right? Because so there, Paul's not writing out this list of sins so we know the checklist of what's good and worse and, and that. Because um, remember that if we break the law, the sentence is the same, right? God does not rank sin. Sin is the anything that breaks relationship with God. So um, that's why you hear in, the, in last week's reading, reading, that God says, don't judge. Don't judge because lest you be judged as well, right? And we, we flip that around and we say, well, don't you judge others because God's going to judge you. Well, that is true, but God judges all of us. So all of this, all these words that Paul has used so far is writing to outline this one simple fact that all have sinned and all will surely die. And that God feels that separation keenly, keenly. Many of our translations call this deep felt feeling the wrath of God. Now, you're going to see some of my Greekiness today. Because when I come on a word like wrath, I go, well, what was the original Greek? What were they really trying to say? And so I went back and I looked. And the Greek word that is translated wrath so often is the word orge. And it means an internal disposition which steadfastly opposes. So, or, or another definition that goes with it is to team, to swell up. And this implies it's not a sudden outburst, but it is a fixed, controlled, passionate feeling. So the wrath of God, I want to know when the first person who, who translated that orge into wrath, what wrath meant in those days. Because I think it might have meant something different than what it does today. Because when we hear the word wrath, we get the picture of an angry God. And actually, what the Greek means is that God has this fixed, controlled, passionate feeling opposing sin. The very thing that separates us from God and a relationship with God. So why would God not oppose that strongly? It's not this uncontrollable rage. It's not God sitting on a throne waiting to point his fingers or to snuff us under his toes. It is this passionate feeling against sin. And we can't help it. This is the state that we're born into, right? We live in a state of sin, a state of brokenness. And so without God changing things... The consequence of sin is that we will surely die. We will die today while we live here on earth, but we will die in the ever, laugh, ever after from this life as well. And, and in Paul's writing up to this point, he is pointing to these truths. And I want to share this. I just read it for you earlier, but I want to share it with you from the version called The Message, which uses a little bit more of our English vernacular, um, modern day vernacular. And so it, those verses read like this. So where does this put us? Basically, all of us, whether insiders or outsiders, start in identical conditions, which is to say that we all start out as sinners. Scripture leaves no doubt about it. There's nobody living right, not even one. We've all taken the wrong turn. We've all wandered down blind alleys. No one's living right. This makes it clear. Scripture makes it clear, doesn't it? 
that whatever is written in these in these scriptures is not what God says about others, but to us, to whom these scriptures are addressed in the first place. And it's clear enough, isn't it, that we're sinners, every one of us, in the same sinking boat with everybody else. Our involvement with God's revelation doesn't put us right with God. What it does is force us to face our complicity in everyone's sin. Our own sin and our complicity in others' sin. Our brokenness, our breaking of relationship with others and with God. Anytime we put something we want in front or desire in front of God, um, it, we, we break that relationship. And that is all of us. Every single one of us. You know, when I uh, was first thinking about uh, this part of the system, you know, this uh, first part, it, it doesn't always come across as uplifting. Um, and, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's not the good news for today? Well, you know, <laughs> the, actually, when you said that it was the good news after doing the reading, I actually, uh, you know, especially after hearing the description of the wrath of God is really God's passion for the relationship that he wants to have with us. Uh, yes, it is good news. Yeah. This is absolutely good news. And, I think so too. Uh, you know, we, sh we should uh, hear it as such and, um, and not, not just hear the, the, the shame and the guilt of, yeah. uh, of uh, the brokenness, but the reality that God passionately wants to have this fellowship with you. Absolutely. Right? So, you know, next week we're going to talk about the remedy, uh, which is, you know, what we traditionally talk about as the gospel or the good news and right. uh, the remedy for sin. So God does have a remedy for the the condition of our of our sin and and uh, so you know come back next week because I guarantee you won't be disappointed. <laughs> That's right. We all we like I said earlier we tried to jump over the whole sin problem, right? But it's very real and there is good news in the midst of it. So um, continue to send us your thoughts and your questions this week. Um, get ready to write this down. If you want, the reading for this week is um, Romans 3.21. That's where we left off last week. Romans 3.21 through 5.21. And somebody said, I thought we were reading chapters. Well, we're reading ideas. Remember, chapters and verse were put in later, and they don't always, um, they didn't always break things up in, in what I would consider things that ways that make sense. So 321 to 521 this week. Um, keep sending us your questions and um, and keep diving in. Don't give up on Paul yet. All right. And Jane, this this obviously it's taking a little longer than oh, it uh, is. Yeah. Know, than some sermons do. But uh, you know, as we we as we work through this, we want you to you know be patient with us. It's important for us to cover the whole subject, and okay. sometimes teaching takes a little longer. Should, should we tell them that earlier this week we had like a two-hour sermon? Well, we started actually with a <laughs> lot of material, but uh, and don't forget to wear your blue shirts next week. That's right. Will you pray with me, please? Ah, oh, Lord Jesus, uh, we confess that uh, we really like the message of love and grace and joy and. Uh, messages like today, we'd like to kind of put on the back burner, kind of sort of recognize that they're there, but not really spend a lot of time on them. But I thank you for the gift of these texts today. I thank you for the gift of the reminder that you are passionately opposed to the brokenness which separates us from you. And so as we head into this next week and this next week's reading, God, let us hold that in your heart, not the list of sins to decide what's better or what's not, but the realization that we all sin and we have all fallen short um, of what your desire is for us. And then recognize that you have a deep, abiding passion to deal with the sin, the brokenness that keeps us from you. So keep us wrapped in that truth this week, Lord, and, um, and give us the, the courage Give us the, um, the wisdom to uh, continue to dive deeply into your word. We pray this in your name and power. Amen. I would invite you all to stand with us for a moment. <clears throat> We're going to sing a song <clears throat> about dry bones coming to life. And I would like to take just a second and give you an image. Today is Father's Day, and um, I am the proud father 
of four children of color. Incredibly proud. And this week, in my predominantly white neighborhood, my child was walking down the street and someone pulled up in a pickup truck, rolled down their window and said, get out of my neighborhood, brown skin. And then they started making up lies about him having a gun at the community pool. We are broken people. Today's Father's Day, but you might not know, but today's also Juneteenth. After the Emancipation Proclamation took place in 1863, it took over two years, it took over two years for the final slaves to be freed in this country by the Union General. General Order Number 3 was given. We are broken people. We create divisions. And as Jane and Jeff said, we live in this sin that causes us to harm one another over a chemical in our skin that changes the color of our skin. We are broken people, and God is right to be passionately against that. So I'm a father, and I'm a proud father of four children of color. If you're a father today, I hope that you have a great, amazing Father's Day. And I hope that we will take seriously the lesson that we have just heard, that God has no tolerance for the sin that we carry within us. And praise be to Jesus that there is hope for all of us. Praise be to Jesus.
Pray for God to breathe, to breathe into us, to breathe into this time. And he does just that. He shows up in, in bread and in wine. And he breathes new life. He reminds us that sin is not, does not get the final word, but that God's grace and glory does. And so as we prepare to come to this table of hope this morning, our friends online, I invite you to hold your elements with us and, uh, and to say these words of Jesus with us. On the night Jesus showed his greatest love for us, he took a piece of bread, gave thanks for it, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples as he gives it to us today, saying, take and eat. For this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of this bread, do it and remember me. And then we say together, after supper, he took a cup of wine. He gave thanks for it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples as he gives it to us today, saying, Take and drink, for this is the new promise in my blood, shed for you and all people, for the forgiveness of all your sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do it and remember me. And as we remember Jesus, then I invite you to pray with me the prayer that he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. For our friends online, we invite you to share God's el these elements with one another with words such as, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And if there's someone in your midst who doesn't take communion, we invite you to give them a word of blessing, whatever words feel right to you. Here in the sanctuary this morning, there will be two stations here in the front where we will receive, you'll come forward and you'll receive a piece of bread and then um, take a step over and receive wine or grape juice in a small cup. Wine is darker and on the outside, grape juice is lighter and on the inside. If you are a young one who receives communion, we invite you to remember to put your hands out like this. And that helps our servers know that you get to receive communion as well. Um, all are truly welcome at this table. Does not matter what your church denominational background is or if you don't have any at all. 
If you believe in the love of Jesus, if you desire his love in your life, we invite you to come. And even if you choose not to uh, take part in the elements this morning, we invite you to come for a word of blessing as well. And it also is the time when we take this morning's offering, and so we invite you to drop that in the basket as you come forward, or in the bulletin, there are multiple ways to do it online. My friends, the table of grace and hope is open to all, and so come, eat, drink, and be fed with the bread of life.
and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your presence with us here this morning. We thank you that we live in a place where we can gather freely and worship you openly. We pray for those, all those who find themselves today in places where that's not true. We pray, we pray for the broken places in this world, the places that are filled with violence and war, like the Ukraine, places that are filled with 
violence and destruction in alleyways and schools, in places that are filled with brokenness and sorrow, homes, neighborhoods. We pray, Lord, that you would make your presence known in those places. And we realize when we pray that often we are the answer to, your, to the prayers. So Holy Spirit, come. Let us not be content with the brokenness we see around us, but give us the courage and the passion to try to help find some of the brokenness, heal the wounds that we see around us every day. And thank you. Thank you that in the midst of brokenness, we find joy. In the midst of sadness, there can be laughter. In the midst of sickness, there can be healing. Let us seek those out. Let us be those in your world today. We pray this in your name and power, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I know you're going to find this really surprising, but we have um, basically one announcement today. I know, I know. Hold your horses. But it's sure Deanne. Two. There's two. I'm sorry, there's two. Sorry, I've corrected. There's two. So come on. Yep, come on up, Deanne. You, Deanne gets the stage like every Sunday, all Sundays, right? Between now. Um, good morning. Um, I just want to make one really, really quick announcement because I know you've been hearing all kinds of things from me. Um, registration for Kids Camp. If you're listening here or online or if you have friends who you know intend to register their children, we are nearing our capacity. So let's get those kids registered quickly um, because I definitely don't want anybody to miss out on this fantastic week that we have coming up here in about four weeks, I believe. Um, yes. And then um, on the screen, if you've not been around, there's a couple of QR codes up there. You can support one of our service projects. Do you know who that was? That, that was your husband. I'm just saying, by the way. I know. Not to I call know. anybody out, John, but that was you. Know. He's next sitting next to Elaine, so there's always got to be a couple yeah, of hecklers. Uh, they can't play together anymore. Seriously. Uh, okay. All right. Um, he's probably kind of, you know, he's he's probably kind of complaining because he's going to help uh, cut cactuses on Father's Day. So anyway. Um, but yes, a couple of QR codes up on the screen. And um, you can either give financially at the one QR code or you can go to our Amazon wish list to help us purchase project or products for our service project. And if you have questions, you can always reach out to me. Thanks. It's going to be so full here. Yay. All right. And um, the second announce, the other announcement for this morning is that um, South Table Mountain Preschool continues to grow. And, um, and we love that. And uh, they are looking for teachers, uh, for the, some teachers and teachers assistants coming into the fall here. And, uh, and so you don't have to have a um, early childhood education degree in order to be able to teach in the preschool or help out there. So um, information is there online. It's also in Teams and in the bulletin. And um, if you'd be interested in finding out more about that, contact Kristen, our preschool director. Um, with that, I want to invite you to stand and receive God's blessings on our way today. Now, as we go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shower you abundantly with his mercy and his grace. And may Jesus call you ever closer to him, that as you walk with him, you might be him in a world who desperately needs him. We say in the name of the power of the creator, the savior, and the redeemer. Amen. Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be
be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, 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 oh. Blessings, everybody. Have a great rest of your week.